Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Jerusalem Fund and our educational program, the Palestine Center. Um, welcome to our audience here and our audience online. Our audience here, thank you for your patience as we, you bear with us with our renovations and repairs of the office, but I think we're, we're pleased that this room is going to work out. Um, we are, uh, every summer we have a new batch of interns who put together always a very stimulating intern lecture series. And our interns this year um, have met our expectations and exceeded them yet again. The title of our, our whole, the theme of our series is Mobility, Israel's Structural Restrictions and Palestine's Resistance. And our interns are Abby Massel, Mervat Salame. I'm sorry. Is it muffled? Okay, is that better? Okay, we'll move it again when Julie's up here. Um, our interns, um, we're so proud of them, all of them, Abby Messel, Mirvat Salame, Sarah Dikczynski, and Zoe Reinstein have put together this wonderful series on mobility. Every year we, we look forward to sort of a new and fresh perspective on everything, and we're really delighted with this theme and with our interns this year. Um, and uh, so, of course, our main speaker today, our first speaker who's going to set the theme and the whole framework for this series is Dr. Julie Petit, who will be talking about conceptions of mobility. So I'll, I'll hand it over to Mervat Salame. Oh, to Zoe Reinstein. Thank you. Thank you, Zaina, for that great introduction. Uh, my name is Zoe Reinstein again, and I'm one of the Palestine Center summer interns. Um, so when, cho when choosing the theme of mobility, uh, when we first started thinking about this year's theme, um, we realized that mobility is at the core of so many of Israel's occupational strategies aimed at the dehumanization and subjugation of Palestinians. When initially discussing possible themes, we talked about the main tools of the occupation, such as the separation wall, the blockade of Gaza, legal barriers such as visas and the denial of the right to the return, and the obstruction of the Palestinian voice in many international media outlets. We then realized that all these factors strategically restrain the physical mobility of Palestinians in the West Bank, Gaza, and diaspora as a whole, but also, and perhaps more importantly, the movement of ideas through censorship and media outlets. As you'll hear from a moment uh, from Dr. Petit, mobility is integral in defining and claiming spaces of living to affirm a community's identity, and therefore restrictions on Palestinian mobility are some of the most apparent and dehumanizing aspects of the military occupation. That being said, Palestinians overcome this lack of mobility through publication, expression, and the creation of their own platforms when necessary. They have used media as a powerful tool in the spread of ideas beyond the walls of the occupation, ultimately a form of resistance in itself. Um, and just please join us for the rest of the lecture series. This Friday on July 11th, we'll have a second installment titled Restrictions on Mobility, Structural Mechanisms and Physical Barriers with Dr. Shir Robinson and Mr. Minam Raruf, who's here today as well. Um, then the series concludes on Tuesday, July 26, with Overcoming Restrictions, Resistance Through Publication and Expression with Leila Haddad and Dr. William Humans from GWU. And we just want to, uh, say again, welcome our online audience, and we'll have a, a discussion um, and question and answer period at the end, and our live stream audience can send questions via Twitter to at the Palestine Center. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Jerusalem Fund. My name is Mirvat Salama, and I'm an intern here at the Palestine Center. We are pleased to have anthropologist Dr. Julie Petit with us today from the University of Louisville, where she is a professor of anthropology and director of the Middle East and Islamic Studies program. She has spent 10 years in the Middle East, conducting research on Palestinian refugees, displacement, gender, resistance, culture, and human rights. The title of her talk today is Conceptions of Mobility, in which she will draw conceptual analyses from her forthcoming book titled Space and Mobility in Palestine, where she explores the significance of mobility in terms of power, identity, and meaning for Palestinians living under Israeli occupation. Her publications include Landscape of Hope and Despair, Palestinian Refugee Camps, Gender in Crisis, Women and the Palestinian Resistance Movement, and several other significant works found in journals and books pertaining to the Palestinian plight and the Middle East. <coughs> 
Her work has been funded by the Fulbright Program, the Andrew w. w. Mellon Foundation, the Palestinian American Research Center, and among many more. So we thought she would be the perfect speaker to start off our series about mobility in Palestine. And we're delighted that she's accepted our invitation. And without further ado, please welcome Dr. Julie Petit. Thank you for that lovely introduction and to the Jerusalem Fund for having me here today. Can you hear in the back? How's that? <clears throat> Is that better? <laughs> no. <laughs> okay, I'll try to speak very loudly. How's that? I'm looking at you in the back. If, to make sure you can. You're okay. All right. Um, okay. Well, let's see. Oh, it's always where to start. I'll start with how I started this latest research project and book, which will also tell you a little bit about how anthropologists, some, some of us anthropologists work. Um, I started this research in the West Bank around 2004, and I hadn't planned to be doing this research, but I went to the West Bank for a conference and saw the wall and Kalendia checkpoint and was just bowled over by this, the enormity of this wall uh, on the landscape, this, this very highly visible uh, but very primitive uh, low-tech symbol of separation and immobilization. It was the, the visuals that I think really got me. And then of course having to pass through Kalandia, the embodied experience, if you will. And so this sparked my interest in mobility um, and its physical or you know, structural and bureaucratic mechanisms that have immobilized Palestinians, made them at once mobile and immobile, visible and invisible, subject to both ordering practices and disordering practices, very sort of contra seemingly contradictory things. And about over 20 years ago, I remember giving a talk at Penn on work that I had done for the book on Landscape of Hope and Despair, which was really about space, uh, but also about mobility. And um, I called for a politics of mobility, and people kind of looked at me kind of strangely. And I think if I said that now, wouldn't have to explain much. But at the time, it was still something that was sort of out there. And it reminded me when I uh, wrote the book Landscape of Hope and Despair, I went to Beirut just for a visit, because it had just opened up in 91, 92. And I had no intention of writing that book or going um, to do research in Shatila, which is where I originally uh, worked. But I was so struck, again, by space and mobility. Um, and so I was really connecting, in my mind as a researcher, these two spaces of Palestine, the, the uh, exiled space of the camp which, where Palestinians were immobilized after the camp wars. And they were in shrinking space. And so that set me off on that project. And then I go to the West Bank and I see the same thing, immobilization and shrinking space. And so I felt that with the research in the West Bank, I could really work more on mobility. Um, but in, in this setting, and of course in any settings, you cannot unyoke or separate space and mobility. They are mutually constitutive um, in many ways. So today what I'll do is just talk a little bit about um, how I've conceptualized mobility, um, and then use a few ethnographic examples. And what I found was Palestinians live in this very dense, interwoven network of regulations and control over their mobility that's both physical and bureaucratic. And this is the policy of closure, um, which Israel announced way back in the uh, 90s, around the time of Oslo. It's what Jeff Halper, the Israeli anthropologist, has called the matrix uh, of control. And it's compromised of these overlapping layers um, from the spatial <clears throat> to the legal and the bureaucratic. And in the matrix, victory comes not by defeating your enemy or decimating him, but by immobilizing them. Immobilization as kind of a new uh, strategy of uh, conflict. And of course, in the matrix, the first layer is spatial. And that's where you see the on-the-ground control of space for Palestinians, whether it's through the location of uh, Jewish-Israeli colonies, uh, 
checkpoints, the bypass roads, the military bases, um, this sort of fragmentation of space. And the second layer is the bureaucratic and the legal things that also immobilize Palestinians or regulate, modulate their um, ident uh, mobility, which would be ID cards, the permit system, um, and of course the checkpoints and the wall, which are both, you know, and they, these all overlap. And all of these layers are accompanied by display, vivid displays of violence and the ever-present threat of violence. You don't have to have violence to feel that violence is saturating the atmosphere. Now, getting back to this, uh, the turn to mobilities, if we may call it that, or the new mobilities paradigm, which really took off about 10 years ago. And some of this was, you know, critique of globalization, uh, the, the, the the scholarship on globalization, you know, it's going to lead to this unfettered mobility. People are going to be moving around the globe at high speeds. Well, it didn't work out that way. Um, increasingly, you know, the world is, we see a proliferation of borders, of, of uh, new technologies for identifying and tracking people, and this uh, growth of physical barriers, walls and fences all around the globe, not just in Palestine, but in many other places. And so, you know, you see fortress and gated communities are being replicated on a state level, and Israel's a wonderful example of this, to just fortress and gate a whole country. Now, just briefly, mobilities as a field of study. It, it has arrived, it has a journal. You know, there's a journal of mobilities. When you've got a journal, you've arrived. <laughs> um, there's a handbook of mobilities. <laughs> there are a couple of research centers. So, you know, this, this is part of demarcating a field. It's the institutional uh, accompaniments of, of a field of study. But mobilities is, is you know, it has a very broad scope, which I think is, is good. It has a lot of theoretical and methodological flexibility. It's still very much an emerging framework, and we, most of us who work with mobility work with it in our own uh, particular ways. But it is a good, uh, point of departure or framework, I think, for if you're working on displacement, if you're working on Syrian refugees, you should be working on mobility um, and, and adapting methodologies to those kinds of mobilities. But mobility studies can be everything from a history of mobility to its what initiates mobility, its trajectories, immobilities, regulations, meaning, what does it mean uh, for people to move, and of course, the, the body, the body in waiting or the body in motion, and the body as it experiences mobilities. And here we're getting also to sort of subjectivities. But I think what's clear in the mobilities research is that mobilities is no longer just tacked onto something else like space, okay? It has become itself the foreground through which you can explore a host of other things. And so in looking at mobility as a point of departure, I was exploring, you know, sort of, of course, power um, and inequality, the haves and have-nots of mobility, uh, and in this case, an occupation that is instrumentalizing mobilities for purposes of demographic transformation and transforming a landscape um, for a variety of reasons. So in early mobilities research, uh, and here I'm talking about the early 90s, you know, it became clear that you really had to unpack mobilities and look at the way it's differentiated by power. That um, mobility is not just this homogenous category. It, it's really something that um, is subject to controls. It can be accorded, it can be withheld, it can be modulated. Uh, if you just gloss it over, you really lose any kind of specificity. And we know that many people in the world move with unprecedented speed and, and scope and, and with, uh, by their own choice. And other people have their mobility constrained and monitored um, uh, and sort of encumbered, if you will. And mobilities really do remain tethered to the demands of labor, um, securitization practices, national boundaries, and those increasing state mechanisms of identification that heavily nuance the possibility and extent of mobility, and that is, you know, identity cards, visas, passports, permits, what have you, that constrain and 
uh, magnif uh, regulate mobility. Now, in the past two decades, and especially since 9-11, states have really magnified their hold on their ability to control mobility. And a lot of this is based on new technologies of um, surveillance, and I'm thinking in particular of the biometrics, the biometric identity cards that uh, we see in Palestine now, and of course high detection fences and uh, walls and this sort of thing. So as the ambit and speed of human circulation has expanded, so is its regulation. You know, they're happening sort of at the same time. Um, and Palestine provides, I think, a really wonderful setting in which to explore mobilities and immobilities and their embedding in a regime of control that has an agenda of immobilization for very particular purposes. Now, just to connect mobility with space, I look at mobility, um, it's, it's a way of affirming certain kinds of space. Okay. Space that has colored by particular configurations of power and meaning. And so I look at access to space and the possibility of mobility and the way mobility derives in Palestine from social categories of difference. Okay. Whether they're ethnic or religious, place of residence, citizenship, nationality, these organize access to space and your scope and speed. Uh, when you want to move. So in other words, in Palestine, mobility scope and seed, uh, speed is differentially allocated. So categories of identity, in a sense, have been instrumentalized as an axis around which mobility is allocated. And um, Palestinian mobility is, as we all know, you know, between the wall, checkpoints, permits, the road system, the IDs. Uh, this limits, if your mo mobility is limited, your ability to construct and give meaning to place is impeded. Okay, you cannot construct space that you can't move through. Okay, part of what's defined space is what happens in it and what moves through it. Okay, um, and of course, the mechanisms of closure, the immobilizing mechanisms, are designed such that space will be reconfigured emptied of one and replaced by another, such that you will see new lines of ownership and sovereignty in space where Palestinians uh, do not have access. Now, I'm assuming most people know what closure is, but just very briefly in case you don't, closure was a policy, sorry, closure was a policy launched in March 1993 and it refers to, in a very general sense, Israeli restrictions on the movement of Palestinian goods, people, and labor into Jerusalem, between Gaza and the West Bank, and within the West Bank, okay, and between the West Bank and Israel. So for Palestinians, closure, which is this immobilizing regime, has led to fragmentation, economic devastation, uh, social fracturing, uh, serious problems with um, education and access to health care, and of course a deep sense of isolation, of separation from others, not just Israelis, but from other Palestinians. Okay. Now, by the early 2000s in the West Bank, and I think it's still until today, there are usually around 500 checkpoints at any one time, and many villages are blocked from accessing main roads by uh, the placement of uh, cement cubes or digging trenches such that entry and exit becomes very uh, problematic. And, you know, we think of the circulation, rapid circulation, unimpeded circulation of people, goods, and ideas as an index of modern life. Speed is part of modernity. We, we usually associated with modernity. But in Palestine, for a Palestinian, mobility unfolds in a time warp. Time takes on very different dimensions. You know, if speed is a hallmark of modernity, and in the era of high-speed everything, from travel to food to weapons to communications, Palestinians sort of are suspended uh, in this web of immobility, a kind of trap, if you will, that has them moving often at a speed from another generation, okay, another era, if you will. 
and yet they strive to continue their everyday lives uh, in radically altered ways. Uh, they do a lot of resequencing, and in this talk today, I'm not going to go into how they subvert and transgress and resist. I think that'll come up in some of the later uh, talks. Um, but rest assured, they have not been have become they have not become uh, self-disciplining robots who move as they're supposed to. There's a lot of um, subverting of the regime. Now. Going from one locale to another has become a real exercise, of course, in, in travel, uh, in subterfuge, in patience, in cunning. Uh, space is an obstacle to be overcome and mastered anew, sometimes daily or weekly, you know, as a new checkpoint sets up and you have to find a new way to go around. And um, uh, a young woman that uh, I know in uh, Ramallah, she wanted to go to Jerusalem to participate in a professional training workshop for a day. And she, did, she had to apply for a permit and uh, you know, was very upset at the whole idea because she figured she wouldn't get it and she just burst out and said, I don't want to be excited about anything that involves the future because you don't know if it will really happen. Our whole life is like this, not knowing if something's really going to happen. And that's kind of how people live, that this suspended in time. Is what I want to do tomorrow going to happen tomorrow? Something we never think about. If we make a plan for tomorrow, you can rest assured it's pretty much going to happen. Um, so people's sense of time has been greatly affected by uh, closure and immobilization. Now, we know that states monopolize the legitimate means of movement. That's part of what states do, and they issue documents, they issue passports and um, birth certificates and, and um, visas and what have you. What distinguishes mobility's deep entanglement with power in Palestine is that here we have the monopolization of a non-citizen's population, a non-citizen population's movements within a territory not incorporated into the state. Okay, um, and this interlocking set of obstacles to Palestinian mobility penetrates deep into everyday life. It has real and experiential consequences that are endless, ultimately bound up with the production of new forms of space. Because if you can't move through space, it becomes clear to Palestinians that space becomes something else. Okay. Now, in great part, human history is a story of mobility. And an anthropologist, we have to go way back and remember that human history, we've always been moving. Um, but this is, you know, we're in another era. It's a different kind of movement. And we've always overcome distances, and we've always used new technologies to do so. But in our era, <coughs> mobility is an indicator of human rights and of modernity. And this policy of closure and immobilizing Palestinians is producing a kind of space to which they are excluded. Their exclusion, in a sense, constructs space, sets it up to be, to take on a new identity. And then once it has this new identity, they can't move through it anyway. Okay, so I hope that makes sense, this uh, intermingling of space and mobility. Um, and we couldn't use PowerPoint or maps in here today because of the light. Um, but if, if you can visualize the West Bank in what's called Area C, you know, the Oslo dividing the West Bank into areas A, B, and C, if you look at A at C, which is basically Israeli territory, um, and Palestinian territory, what's left are all in these little fragments. Okay, the, the, it's often described as an archipelago. And the... Uh, challenge for a Palestinian is to move from one island to another within the sea that you cannot cross. So it's how do you move from one area to another when you're marooned on these little islands, if you will. You move, but very slowly, often denied, and uh, having to pass through multiple checkpoints. Now, uh, one way of looking at mobility uh, in this area is to look at it as relational, okay? That Palestinian and Israeli mobilities are very intertwined with one another. And what that means is, in this case, one's mobility is constrained 
surveyed, managed, interrupted, and decelerated. The other's mobility, the Israelis, is accelerated and spatially expansive. They move through contiguous territory at a speed of their own making. Okay? Whereas where the Palestinian can move and the speed is determined by the uh, occupying authorities. So this is the relationality, if you will, that the immobilization of the Palestinian clears space for Israelis to move with speed, okay, and at their own pace, and through, of course, secured space. Um, so, you know, I would see, and sometimes this is very visual, you know, you can see at a checkpoint Israeli cars moving very quickly without going through the checkpoint, they sort of whiz on through, and the Palestinian line is, you know, 100 cars deep, moving at a very, very slow pace. Um, and that's the relationality of these, these mobilities when you juxtapose them. Okay. Um, now, there's an interesting statement by uh, a religious studies scholar, Sigurd Bergman, who writes on uh, mobility, of all things. And he, he's, I'm going to quote him, he says, could we restate the French philosopher Descartes by saying, instead of saying, I think, therefore I am, Bergman says, I move, ver therefore I am, okay? Or I am how I move, okay? So he linked movement and space to sort of a geography of subjectivity, okay? In a setting of pronounced mobility. The way your mobility, you know, the way you move starts having this impact on your sense of yourself and who you are. Um, I'll give you a small, you know, small anecdote here was that this was a <coughs> a young professional woman uh, who lived uh, in Beit Hanina, kind of a suburb of Jerusalem. And she said, I walk across the street from our house in Beit Hanina. Once the Israelis divided the main street with cement blocks and then placed checkpoints on it, I could no longer walk across the street to go to work. It was less than five minutes away. Instead, I had to go up to the Kalendia checkpoint and go all the way around and then back down the other side of the street. And Kalendia checkpoint can be uh, backed up. This took well over half an hour at best, sometimes more, to go a distance of less than five minutes. She said, I, I have such anxiety and I'm angry all the time. And then she said, I feel like a big bug. This kind of stayed with me. She said, I just feel like a bug here. And I think her sort of narrative <clears throat> of mobility denied, constrained, and ultimately reconfigured. She had to resequence her route every day and negotiate it. Sort of allows you to start fleshing out the relationship or the, the impact of immobility on subjectivities as well. And um, <clears throat> I'm just skipping around here because I know that time will go by quickly. Now, Palestinians understand these techniques of managing mobility uh, as a means of engendering a self-disciplining body, but they also understand it as a tactic of immiseration and a means of quelling uh, resistance and punishment. And from my work, I, I don't think this regime of immobility has been normalized. Now, people do go through the motions, they go through the checkpoints, they hand up you know, their cards, they don't say a word usually, but it's, they're constantly subjected to uh, this very critical analysis um, of what is going on. Uh, they're not just sort of automatons following these rules, and of course, they do subvert and resist everything from little small petty forms of subversion to, uh, you know, trying to vault over the wall, if you will. Um, but, so how do they think of immobilization? And I'll read again what, what uh, a young man that I interviewed said. He said, they want to drive us crazy, literally crazy. They want to make us crazy with this anxiety that we have to live with. And he had come to work late frequently because of the checkpoints. You could never really be sure. You could never be sure what time you will arrive anywhere. 
So you live with constant uncertainty and unpredictability, and this leads to a lot of anxiety. So he said, if you can't plan from one day to the next, and there's never any real explanation for why you're denied a permit or turned back at the checkpoint, you just get so frustrated. Uh, daily life becomes unmanageable. It takes so much time to do anything. Everything becomes an ordeal, and you're never certain what will happen. You add it all up, and you figure they want you to go crazy with frustration. Then you'll start thinking about leaving. And this is what you hear often, that the immiseration is part of encouraging people to leave. Okay. Now, okay. Now I just want to look at <clears throat> the identity card, the permit system, and the road system to see how this works. And I'm not really doing the wall, and, and the checkpoints kind of come in here, but I can't do it all in a short period of time. But start with the identity card. Okay. And again, I'll start with sort of an ethnographic uh, example or anecdote. I visited a, a friend who had uh, a young, uh, a teenage son. And when I went in the house, I could hear the dad and the son in the midst of quite a, a loud quarrel over the identity card. The 17-year-old son had stopped carrying his nine-digit Israeli-issued identity card, which every Palestinian must possess in order to legally reside in Palestine. You've got to have it with you all the time. You can't go through a checkpoint without it. Um, you can't apply for a permit without it. And people carry it all the time because if you get stopped without one, you can be arrested, you can be detained, and more recently, you can be deported. Um, so his father was, I mean, hysterical almost that his son was running around without an identity card because he had lost it in the mess of his bedroom. And he said, he, you know, this father was screaming. He said, I got caught once. I had my identity card, but I didn't know the number. I couldn't memorize it. I couldn't recite it. And so I was beaten up at the checkpoint. And so he said, you've got to carry this ID card. And the son says, I don't go anywhere anyway. He said, I don't move outside of this, almost this neighborhood. So in any case, it gives you a sense of the, the, the importance of the identity card. So with the occupation, the Israelis assumed control over the Palestinian civil registry, and they assigned everybody at a nine-digit number. And they're classified into four general classes and over 40 subcategories, which I don't know all the subcategories, and most Israelis don't either. So that when you get to a checkpoint, there's a lot of going back and forth as to what category people are in. Um, now, colonial regimes craft population categories and ways of making them substantive, visible, and tangible in everyday life. And I think the identity card is probably the most fundamental document that encodes and regulates Palestinian entitlements and deprivations and the scope and speed of mobility. Um, and as part of Oslo, Israel did retain control over the Palestinian civil registry and thus the allocation of identity cards. Okay. And you go through a PA intermediary between uh, these two entities. <coughs> Now, the identity card joins a host of techniques that compel this sort of knowable, uh, legible Palestinian uh, subject. Okay. So the document, because it determines where you can live and where you can move and not move legitimately, the document is this very critical artifact. Okay. It at once encodes and it produces legal distinctions and it inflects subject. It, it, has an impact on subjectivity because it creates differences among Palestinians according to who has what identity card. And if any of you, and I know many of you are familiar with this, these are color-coded, your identity card's in a little color-coded sleeve. And that color says a lot when you hold it up or you go through the checkpoint. That's my phone. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Hopefully that's the last of it. <laughs> Oh, I should have known better. In any case, um, this same young man uh, who was talking about being driven crazy, he was talking about all these different identity cards. He has a West Bank identity card, and he said, all these different identity cards separate us from each other. Each begins to see the other as different, and we start resenting the small privileges. 
Palestinians with Jerusalem identities began to think of themselves as better than us in the West Bank <laughs> because they get a few benefits from the Israelis. So again, he's talking about this fragmentation and sense of identity and belonging in the Palestinian community. And this color coding system, it's kind of like branding. You know, it, it marks you and makes you visible um, not only to other Palestinians, but also obviously to the occupier. And in, in this book, I, I have a chapter on just on checkpoints uh, where I describe the checkpoint as a ritual. Uh, it, it's a funnel trap, which is a, a nice description that a biologist helped me. I was trying to understand spa the, the spatial move through uh, a checkpoint, and it's a funnel, and it's a funnel trap, which are used by biologists in the wild to catch animals and tag them. And um, that's sort of the imagery that I had. But in any case, there's this ritualized set of um, actions that quickly unfolds. The identity card is almost always in the hand or at the ready, so that you don't have to fumble for it. It's, it's there, it's been pulled out of the purse or the pocket well before you get to the checkpoint. Um, people at the checkpoint see it, they immediately know uh, your identity, whether you're West Bank or you are um, uh, Jerusalem. So it, in a way it's become, an, I call it the appendage, because it's always attached to the hand as you near a checkpoint. And often soldiers don't even look at it because it's always at the ready and the um, security is not always what it's cracked up to be. Now, new techniques of surveillance have emerged, particularly um, in this case with biometrics, which I'll just bri very briefly explain. Uh, but this is a situation where half the population watches the other half. Okay? It's not just a small crew watching people. Um, Palestinians are under surveillance not only because colonies are on higher ground and they're always visible, and they're visible, of course, at the, uh, these almost 500 checkpoints. And Israeli citizens are always on guard for people who look suspicious. So it's really a population that feels itself always being watched and under surveillance. And um, it can be used, the identity card, not only as, as a weapon, it's a form of punishment. Uh, you have a, get into a, issue at a checkpoint or you've done something that might be slightly suspicious or not suspicious, uh, the threat to confiscate your identity card is a very real one and it often happens. You're asked to collaborate, you know, provide names or information and then we'll give you your identity card back. Um, or a driver of a taxi is caught with somebody who doesn't have a Jerusalem ID, the taxi driver's ID could be taken and then he's fined, it's a substantial fine, and he loses a lot of days of business because he can't drive. Um, so it, it, the identity card is not just to know the Palestinian, um, it's also to compel a kind of obedience, okay, and punish people as well. Now biometrics, which I think we're all becoming much more familiar with, um, biometrics are when you encrypt in an identity document uh, sort of physical aspects of the body. Okay? The body becomes its own technology of verification. And you know the first uh, biometrics, the oldest one, fingerprints. And now we have the iris scan and facial recognition. DNA is the ultimate, but nobody's doing DNA yet um, in this situation. So. The, the biometrically encoded card is a way to verify that the person is who they say they are. So that you go to the checkpoint and they have the fingerprint reader. You put your fingerprint up in your biometrically encoded card and they better match, okay? You can't use somebody else's identity card, which is one of the ways people do circumvent some of these rules of this little petty transgression or subversion. Um, now, just moving on to the permit system, which I call the paper wall, uh, because it forms a wall of another sort that uh, determines also how people move. And again, I'll start with just a little anecdote. Um, a middle-aged professor from Al-Quds University who lived in Abu Dis was invited to give a lecture in Jerusalem. Uh, however, 
she was she had a West Bank identity card, so she required a permit to enter the city, which is just you know, a kilometer or two over the wall. Um, so she took her documents to the appropriate office and was told to return at 9 a.m. on the day of her lecture to get her permit. Her lecture was supposed to be at 11 o'clock. So she comes back promptly at 9 that morning and waits and waits and waits, and at noon she's given the permit. So the lecture is finished, and I heard this story frequently. You get the permit after the event, uh, or the permit's for 12 hours and you're given it when you might have two hours left. Okay. And um, common stories. Okay, so the permit system also governs and regulates mobility, and it compels compliance and collaboration. Again, if you want a permit, sometimes you're told you can have a permit, but why don't you give us some information about somebody or so and so? But it's a very mysterious process to get a permit. Time-consuming. Uh, sometimes you have to travel to a place where you can't travel because you don't have a permit. Okay, um, the criteria for getting a permit is unstated and very hard to discern, and it always seems very arbitrary. And a phrase that people use a lot in the West Bank is, it all depends on their mood. I hear this a lot, whether it's at a checkpoint or with a permit. Depends on their mood that day. But it seems arbitrary, but it, it's not so arbitrary. What I came up with, or uh, finished this field work with was that this disorder and seeming ambiguity is itself consistent. That's the consistency, is consistent ambiguity so that you live in a state of uncertainty and anxious anticipation. And again, here's somebody who needed to go to Jer Jerusalem to, for a doctor's visit, uh, but needed a permit. And she said uh, she was denied the permit. Permits are another way to strangle us, to rule us, and to make life so awful we will leave. Okay? And that's why this is immobility and mobility. Palestinians move, but not at their own speed uh, and, and scope. And there's Palestinians feel that there is uh, that this is a way of making them leave by making life unlivable, particularly in rural areas that they will empty out and people will move into these few remaining urban areas. Okay. Um, all right. I um, just want to mention something about humiliation. and I, Because I think the stories really hopefully illustrate uh, what mobility is a concept and how we can use it. And um, I had a neighbor in Ramallah who got a 12-hour permit to pray at Jerusalem's uh, Church of the Holy Sepulcher. And uh, he told me later about going through the checkpoint. And he said, I felt so humiliated. I hold my permit up to the plexiglass window and this 18-year-old bitch, excuse my language, flicks her wrists at me to go as if I'm a fly, as if I'm nothing. I waited so long for a permit that she barely glanced at. Okay? And on another occasion, I met an acquaintance again, who had a half-day permit to go to Jerusalem on religious grounds. And he was so excited, but then he looked at his watch and he said, um, oh my God, I have to run. Uh, my permit expires at six, and I have to buy my mother her favorite bread from a shop in Musrara, where she was born, but could no longer visit. So he was very sheepish, like a child, getting home before curfew. Um, on a bus, these kind of petty indignities were part of the routine texture of the permit system. Uh, on the bus one day, an elderly gentleman uh, was on this bus, and the soldier gets on the bus and screams at him, give me your ID card. He examines it and the permit, and he says to this elderly gentleman, you're almost late. Your permit to enter Jerusalem ends at 6, and it's now 5.55. These are the petty indignities. Okay. Um, now I'm just going to say five minutes on roads and then I will uh, finish this. The road system, the bypass roads, the whole road network that many of you are familiar with. Uh, a couple of over middle-aged friends and I are in Ramallah and we decide to go to Abu Dis one day. Now these guys all have cars, they all grew up there, and they've all spent their life driving around. 
So we meet, and they, nobody knew how to get to Abu Dis from Ramallah. Okay, a very short distance, maybe 10 kilometers, something like that. And they had no idea which roads to take. Okay, so needless to say, we took a bus. But what has happened is that people's sense of the landscape, the landscape has become unknowable. It is becoming foreign. Okay. So, you know, we all have mental maps, geographic imagination. We all have an, uh, uh, knowledge of, of the landscape that we acquire socially and experientially through moving through space. And Palestinians, like many uh, people, do not use maps. I mean, you never see them with a map figuring out where they're going to go, like we do when we're tourists or we're in a new place. They know the landscape from living there, from traveling through it. But increasingly, they find it difficult to navigate in the landscape. And people will tell me, well, I, I, know, that I know this place, but, but it all looks different. I don't know which road to take. And the signs, because the signs are now uh, in Hebrew in a lot of areas, they, they really feel lost. And a kind of disorientation sets in. That, you're, that very intimate relationship you had with landscape and with place has been disrupted. Okay. Now, in the future, archaeologists will per perhaps excavate the West Bank, the road system, kind of like now archaeologists are always excavating ancient roads, the Roman road system. And I think they'll uncover what we might then term the occupation era. And I think what they'll find, or they'll start speculating about this era, inequality and privilege are etched into the road system. And it will be read by the eye trained in archaeology and excavated strata. They'll see the smoothly paved bypass roads with their ubiquitous surveillance devices. And then they'll see the old, rutted, circuitous uh, roads that were consigned to the Palestinians. Rusty, tangled barbed wire and the tell-like mounds will mark the once blocked villages. Perhaps these archaeologists will also uncover the crumbling, yellowed, and frayed remnants of the permits and the various metals and cement and the crumbling watchtowers and technological devices that were the checkpoints. Roads weave together elements of daily life, whether it's work or school or healthcare or shopping or trade, commerce, family, social networks. Roads bridge distance and obstacles to connect us to each other, as they have throughout history. So this road system is a material artifact okay, that sort of encodes hierarchy and privilege. Okay? And through it, we can conceptualize somewhat a society's circulation, their movement, their worldview, as well as, you know, we use roads to look at ancient trade networks, okay? economies, levels of integration and relations with the exterior. Okay, now, I know my time is, is short now. I'll just say that what the road system does, the bypass roads with that medical lexicon, okay, is they bypass the indigenous population and they create contiguous space for Israelis so that they do not have to have contact with Palestinians, that they're not driving on the same roads, that they are separated from them, if you will. Uh, and there are a variety of roads. There are shared roads, but I um, don't have time to go into that here. Uh, okay, so just to conclude one small anecdote. In an office, the office manager tells everybody when they go home that night to take their laptops because, as she says, none of us really know if we will be here tomorrow, if we can come to work. So daily life lurches forward in crisis mode. It's sequencing, enveloped in uncertainty. Um, this is the, I move, therefore I am, I am how I move. And mobility is central to human subjectivity. It's essential to being human. Part of the human condition is movement. And the sense of the self, the I, and the knowledge of where you are, which is, has been so disrupted uh, with closure and this regulation of mobility. So I'll end there and we'll take questions.
Um, <coughs> sorry, my name is Emma Hobbs. I go to Arizona State. Um, I'm particularly curious in your research and particularly in your interviews, did you find a difference um, for those Palestinians who had lived in Palestine prior to 1948 or 1967 um, and their conception of space loss? Um, and is it even in the imaginary of those who have grown up in the occupation, right? You talked mm -hmm. about the 17-year-old yeah. didn't leave his space, right? Yeah. Like, is it in their imaginary that space yeah. loss? You know, this is a, a really good question. We were just talking about this bef before. Um, some of it is generational. Say you're a 60 or 70 year old. Microphone. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, it was saying it's generational. Say you're a 60 or 70 year old. You still have a memory. You have that geographic imaginary or memory of where things are and how to get to them, right? Now, as you go down in the generations, uh, it, particularly with the younger generation, if I can skip to youth, their geographical knowledge now is, is really at risk. They don't know where things are. Uh, and one thing to pay attention if you work on mobility is how people talk about time. Um, in this book, I also have a chapter on time uh, that I couldn't go into here. Now when you ask people how far is something, they often measure it in um, checkpoints. Okay, because they, they didn't used to tell you distance. You know, I, I had been in the West Bank prior to closure and people would say, oh, you want to go to Janine, it's maybe an hour and 15 minutes. Now they'll tell you it's five checkpoints. Okay, because there is no telling how long it takes to get there. Now, geographic knowledge though is also transmitted in families. By, by parents, and I remember this, you know, I worked in the camps in Lebanon, and, uh, and this was long ago, so the generation of 48, you know, they were middle-aged then. And they, of course, remembered everything in their villages, pretty much, where things were. They remembered who was fighting with who, who owed who money, who had insulted whoever, you know, and they brought all of these stories to the camps, and some of the same feuds continued. But they had a kind of geographical knowledge that they would transmit to their children. You know, when telling stories, they'd say, well, you know, this was here, the church was here, or the mosque was here, and our fields were here, and this was the road that went to Akka, or, or what have you. Um, so there's a real unevenness about knowledge of space, but what's happening now is younger person not knowing a whole lot, and then people who once traversed these spaces being confused. Uh, I had a colleague who hadn't been home to Nablus in maybe five years, and she told me, she said, I took the bus, and she said, I did not know where to get off. And this is a 40-year-old woman. She said, I could not figure out where I was. Where was the road that would lead to my, to my village? And she said, I was completely disoriented. So that, hopefully, that does that answer your yeah, question? Yeah. yeah. Hang on, because that one's left. <laughs> yeah, uh, cyberspace. Did I work with cyberspace? No. <laughs> I I had so much to cover, and it was just it wasn't my area. But I think it's it's probably what I would hope students are looking at these days. I mean, there are a lot of, if you're thinking of dissertation topics, uh, and, you know, things change so rapidly on the ground in this area also that um, when I was doing this research, the cell phone, you know, was a huge improvement for people because they could communicate and um, calling constantly from checkpoints to say, I'm late or don't come this way, uh, that sort of thing. Um, but no, I didn't work with cyberspace, but thank you. Yeah. I was wondering, what is the legal basis for justifying the discrimination? Would it be uh, movement? Would it be anything in that? Is there anything in the Israeli constitution that could be used to confront that? I'm going to pull something up because... That's always a question, and it's a good one. What are the legal parameters of this? 
if any. Um, one of the problems is that this regime of immobility is not legislated and it's not written down and there are not written orders all the time, okay? So a lot of the chaos at checkpoints, and this is what Israeli scholars have written on this, a lot of the chaos at a checkpoint is simply that the orders change every day. It's orders rather than actual laws, okay? Now, I was looking, I had, uh, I did pull up something on this, this new military order, of course military orders to the Israelis, are, you know, I guess they're legal, but in, you know, this is an occupation which is itself illegal. Um, but 1969 Military Order 329, order regarding prevention of infiltration, which is an important word, infiltration. Um, they amended that military order in 2009, such that anybody caught without a permit can be considered an infiltrator and be imprisoned for seven years or deported. And this scared a lot of people because you can engage in deportation, legal, legal under a military order, deportation. Okay. I'm, I'm not sure if I answered your question, but I'm not, I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> um. Yeah, she, she asked if, you, you know, I mentioned the idea of inconsistencies and ambiguity, and she asked what, what would be the purpose, why would a regime want to inculcate anxiety uh, in a population? Well, it's like this guy told me, they want to drive us crazy. Okay, now that's the, the, the simple explanation. <laughs> but driving people crazy so that life becomes unbearable. And what do you do when life is unbearable? You leave. And that's what people said consistently. And there are, you know, I, I did look through some of the uh, oh, statements by Israeli leaders and settlement leaders, and, and they said, you know, if we strangle them this way, they'll go. They'll go. This is what we call slow motion ethnic cleansing. You just make, you immiserate life. You know, it's not just that you're caught at checkpoints, it's economically. Uh, people have difficulty with, with work, they can't get their goods to market, uh, they can't seek proper health care sometimes, schooling. You know, when you think of Palestine, I mean, the West Bank is an integrated, historically integrated area to have this fragmentation between the north, sort of the middle, and, and the south in Jerusalem really fragments the you know, the central part of the country. Yeah? Oh. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, I worked in Palestine uh, all over the West Bank and Gaza for some years back. Mm -hmm. And my daily colleagues everywhere were large numbers of Palestinians. And I shared with them all of the things that you're saying to the degree that one can as an outsider. Mm -hmm. uh, so I knew that they were frustrated, they were angry, and so forth and so on. But what happened that was mysterious to me was never on a single occasion did I hear anybody lose it mm -hmm. and say, you know, I'm going to kill those bastards or I want to do this. There wasn't that kind of external anger. And I don't know, was it because I was a foreigner? Do they do that with each other? That was a mystery to me. Yeah, and it's, it's a good question. And I've heard this question from other people who go to the West Bank for short periods of time. I had a colleague who came back and he said, I'm surprised the Palestinians aren't more violent, given what they live with. Mm -hmm. He said, given what they live with, it's pretty low levels of, of violence. Um, well, oh, there's many ways to answer this. Uh, what gets said out of earshot of foreigners can be different than what they're gonna say to you. Uh, they also know that you know they're being watched often People are listening, you know, you could be, uh, someone can inform on you that you're threatening to kill people. Uh, 
I think there's an understanding that engaging in random violence doesn't do any good. I think most people understand this. And then there are those who just explode. The, you know, they're trying to drive us crazy, and sometimes they do. But there are high levels of anxiety. And if you talk to pharmacists, they prescribe a lot of anti-anxiety medication because people live with such stress. You know, the, the daily petty kind of stress. Yeah. Oh, this this gentleman had his hand up. Oh. Particularly the, the shootings that we've been in. So oh, well, uh, in Palestine it's called driving while well, Palestinian, DWP, instead of DWB. And Palestinians see a lot of connections with the sort of random, un uncalled for, unjustified uh, shootings of young, of young black men, yeah. A lot of, I, th I think they see a lot of parallels. That's why the Black Lives Matter movement, you know, has some interesting relationships with Palestinian organizations also. They see things in common, yeah. Um, yeah, sorry. Depends what your name is in yeah, the passport. You know yes. How you look, right? Yeah. Mainly the name. Um, <laughs> uh, okay. The passport usually gives you <coughs> mobility because the Israelis don't, they don't always want to mess with you, detaining you at a checkpoint. So they, they kind of let, let you go, especially age has something to do with it also. Age is very much part of the kind of profiling that goes on at checkpoints. Age but and gender. The passport and the visa, like your visa has to Oh, yeah. No. But I was stopped and told to go back at checkpoints. It's not unusual. And I, and I have this in the book because I have a wonderful story of trying to go to Janine. It took two days to go to Janine once from Ramallah. I went with a, a French friend, and we had to take this long route down through the Jordan Valley. And this is in the middle of summer, where it's about 120 degrees and no air conditioning. And we reached the last of probably five checkpoints in the Jordan Valley. That yeah, get to that last checkpoint in the Jordan Valley, which is a notorious checkpoint. And the Israeli soldiers make the two of us get out of the van, and uh, they said, you have to go back. And it was a Friday, noon, 120 degrees. And we said, well, where are we supposed to go? <laughs> and, uh, and, and we said, why? And they said, no foreigners allowed today in Janine. You see, this is just they make it up as they go along. And they had kept us waiting for about half an hour while they ate breakfast. You have to sit in the van in the heat. You can't get out. So the two of us, they told us, oh, some settler, some Israeli will come along and pick you up. And we're like, oh, no, not getting in one of those cars. So we started walking, and it was very hot. And finally, <laughs> a young man uh, picked us up, uh, an Arab Bedouin who lived in the Jordan Valley, and he drove us all the way to Jericho just to be nice, and he had air conditioning in his car. <laughs> but what was so funny about the security was when we walked away from that checkpoint, I, I guess in the chaos, and my friend had been screaming at them, uh, I left my little bag, and they came running after me holding the bag saying, ma'am, you forgot your bag. And I thought, well, so much for security. <laughs> so, so there, you know, you have access and you don't. You can have stories like this. This that one was just kind of a good story, I thought, um, about you know what can happen. Yeah. We we have um, two questions in the back. And did I see someone up? Here? So we have time for about two more questions. Yeah. Um. <laughs> oh. <laughs> 
Um, and I wanted to ask you, um, I know that a lot of Palestinians, in order to enter Israel proper, they have to apply for special permits and workers' permits, and not everyone can right. go there. Um, but what is it, like, what's, um, can you comment on the, the mobility with regards to traveling outside of the West Bank? Palestinians have this been traveling outside to countries like Jordan, Jordan. Egypt, or even Europe. Yeah. Um, are they able to go? Are they able to come back? Or like, you know, if they say that they want them to leave, Okay. And, you know, I'll, I'll just say more about the West Bank than Gaza because I don't know as much about Gaza, but I know it's very difficult to get out of Gaza. You have to go through Egypt, and both the Egyptian authorities and the Israelis often do not uh, allow people to leave. And we hear stories mainly of, of people who have illnesses or young people who want to leave for school. They get a scholarship and they can't go. Now, in the West Bank, if you're a West Bank Palestinian, you cannot fly out of Ben Gurion Airport. So you have to go to Jordan. You have to go across the, uh, usually the, the Allenby Bridge uh, into Jordan. And Jordan has really cracked down on the entry of uh, Palestinians with West Bank IDs into Jordan. You have to have someone who, uh, sort of a guarantor, uh, I think it's a wakil, maybe. They, they show they have a certain amount of money, and you, you say you're only going to stay two or three weeks, this kind of thing. And going back, you know, you always risk, I think, being turned back at the, at the bridge. It's, it's always a risk. There's not a certainty. It's always possible. And of course, before people go to the bridge, they have tremendous anxiety. Everybody has anxiety for that bridge, even if you're a foreigner, because it's, it's, it's nightmarish especially in the summer, and it takes a long time, and you have no idea what's going on around you. Um, so yes, travel outside is often restricted. Um, and I, I don't know about people with Jerusalem IDs. They, they do have to have some kind of an exit permit. And they can't stay away too long, or then they will lose their Jerusalem ID also. Okay. For our last question, sorry, we have to wrap it up. Uh, the Jerusalem Fund is hosting two more events this week. Uh, so on Thursday at 1 p.m. we have Cultural and Educational Development, A Pathway to Resilience and Hope with Ziad Khada. And uh, that was right here, same time, same place. Um, and on Friday we have part two of this lecture series uh, with Manam Maruf and uh, Dr. Shira Robinson uh, entitled Restrictions on Mobility, Structural Mechanisms, and mm -hmm. Physical Barriers, also at 1 p.m. So we hope to see you there. And one last question. Yes. Um, I was wondering if you could address the construction of, of, of space within the areas that the PA has controlled, for example in Ramola, and how the, t the construction and uh, particularly mm -hmm. sort of the basis of a, a neoliberal economic model actually perhaps contributes to, um, you know, the, the repression. Okay. Or if you think it yeah, yeah. Um, I, I know what you mean about Ramallah being, you know, as this sort of headquarters and people flocking in. I mean, Ramallah used to be a sleepy village. It's now probably what we'd call a small city. And there's been a lot of investment in gated communities. I think we've seen some of these. They, they sort of almost look like settlements <laughs> and, and are gated themselves. And, and it's a situation of a lot of haves and have-nots, growing inequality, with I think that sort of whole neoliberal era post-Oslo where so much money came in through the NGOs and people became, some people became quite well off because of that. Um, I mean, Ramallah has been transformed, I think, by that agenda, the post-Oslo uh, agenda, but I don't know if I answered your question. Um, well, I mean, I, I, think it's okay. just, I, I mean, the space of, I mean, the boundaries of Ramallah are expanding. Right. And, and, it, and the question is, how far will they go? Because they do butt up against Greater Jerusalem, but they're going more, I think, to the north and, slight, north and slightly uh, east. And compared to once you leave them, it's in the middle of that. Yeah. Okay. 